you're a good, 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 good God. Um, we ask tonight that you would open our hearts to learn what we will be taught and that we would have ears to hear and hearts to just understand and want to learn more, not just take it out the front door and leave it, but to carry it through our lives and bring us peace tonight. We thank you for all your goodnesses, all your mercies. We love you. We ask that when we sing to you that it would be a sweet savor. In Jesus' name. You guys want to stand before the throne of God above I have a strong and perfect plea a great high priest whose name is love whoever lives and pleads for me my name is graven on his hands my name
beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. Father, we want to thank you for the gift of praise, of worship, 
We want to thank you for your presence here tonight, Lord God. We thank you that we can gather in that wonderful name, that mighty name, named Jesus, Lord. And Father, we desire to know you in a greater way. We desire to know your heart, Lord God. And Father, I know that you want to teach us your heart, Lord God, your ways and your thoughts, Lord God. So Father, give us understanding and knowledge of the Holy One tonight, Lord God. And Father, we look to you. Our eyes are turned toward you. Our hearts are turned toward you and open to you, God. Whatever you want, we want. And bless your people, Lord God, like only you can. In Jesus' precious name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. I want to thank Helen for coming. And Mary Grace and Todd and Pastor Ken. You would have been in trouble if they weren't here. I would have been up here. <laughs> and I mean, you would have been in big trouble. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 10. Let me give you a little bit, a little bit of background before we go into chapter 10. In the last chapter, we saw God appear to Solomon a second time. The Lord warned him to continue in what he had told him so that him and his family and Israel would continue to be blessed. You know, sometimes when we read in the scripture about God appearing to someone, it's something awesome, first of all. But I was in the shower tonight and God didn't appear to me, I promise. <laughs> but I do know that when I'm in the shower, I, I pray and I talk to the Lord a lot. And there are certain things I've asked God to do and I've asked him for wisdom for. And when I was in the shower, God was present in the shower with me. And God ministered to, to my heart. And my point is, God is with you no matter where you go. The Bible says we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that God lives in us. So God is in us, and God is there wherever you are. The thing is, it's like anything. When somebody comes to church, we can ignore them, or we can just say, well, they're here. Or we can be excited about them being here. And the same thing with God. We have to acknowledge his presence. It's not that he's not there. It's not that he doesn't want to make himself known. It's that you have to acknowledge his presence of him being there. God wants you to know that. And why is that so important? God's warned Solomon about things that would happen if he didn't stay true to the word of God. And God warns us many times. And the presence of God, he speaks to us all kinds of things. The word of God, more than anything else. But he speaks to us, but he also warns us at times. And that's what God was doing in the last chapter. He was warning Solomon, hey, make sure you stay true to the word of God. Don't deviate from it. And, and why is he warning them? The same problem you and I may have when we become very prosperous. When all the blessings of God are happening... We have a tendency to deviate or to move away from the word of God because we are prospering. We don't need God, we think, as much. I know we don't on purpose. No one's going to say, as a Christian, who wants God in their life, no one's going to say this, you know what, I got it made now. I really don't need you as much as I need God. You're not going to say that in those kind of words. What you're going to do, this in your lifestyle, you're going to begin to trust in those things more than you're going to trust in God. And at this time, Solomon is so blessed by God, so enormously blessed, more than any kingdom ever. He is more wealthy than any king ever, and or whoever will be. And so he has this chance of this happening. So God is warning him in the previous chapter. And Solomon is doing great and mighty things. He's building all kinds of buildings. He's built the, the house of God. He's built his own house. He's in it 20 some years. He's worked on it 20 some years. 
He's built ships and walls, and he's built all kinds of things. He's on a building frenzy, so to say. But I want to say this about Solomon. Right now, at this point, he's very close to God. And he wants what God wants. And so here we start on verse 1. It says, and this is a great chapter. Now, when the queen of Sheba heard that the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord... She came to test him with hard questions. The Queen of Sheba. She was a queen of Sabaeans. For there was only queens in that area, no kings. Women ruled. I ain't touching that one. Some say that she was also the king, a queen of Egypt. Sabaeans were a nation or a region of Arabia. It was rich in frankincense, spices, gold, and gems. So she, it says here in the scripture that she heard of Solomon's fame. Solomon's fame was going all over the world, the known world at that time. Everyone was talking about Solomon, talking about the wisdom of Solomon. Everyone was talking about the blessings that were on Solomon how wise he was in the decisions he was making, how everything in his land was prospering. There was no dry land or in any way. And Solomon is handling this fame really well. Let me tell you how. Because he was walking with God really close. You see, when you're walking with God really close, and you're depending on God, and you're talking to God on a regular basis, God keeps you in check when you need to be kept in check. So he's doing very well with the fame, the wisdom. It says there she came. How many have ever drove to L.A.? Raise your hand. Isn't it wonderful to drive to L.A. and get into that traffic? and go to San Diego on Highway 5, and go through those cities, and it's jam-packed, and everyone is honking and giving you all kinds of signs. It's wonderful, isn't it? (laughs) Uh, From here, it's about 500 miles. Now, I want you to think about this. The Queen of Sheba is going to travel 1,500 miles on camel. So that would be from here to L.A. and back, and then back down to L.A. Three trips on a camel. And the reason is because she has heard, and one reason only, she has heard of the wisdom of Solomon, and she has a lot of questions she wants to ask Solomon, not only for herself, but for a lot of people that she loves. Listen to what the word says concerning hard questions that she wants to ask. Sayings are questions, perplexing questions, riddles, enigmas, difficult questions, parables. These are the things that's going on in the heart of this woman who is a queen, who is wealthy, who has everything together, so to say, but there are questions in her heart that can't be answered. Now let me ask you a question. Let me be a little personal. Is there questions that you have in your heart? God can answer them. Have you ever wondered why you were created? Before I became a Christian, I always asked that. I said, I don't understand why we were created. I don't get it. And my thoughts were, there has to be more to life than this. Of course, I didn't know God. I didn't know why I was created in any way. I just lived in my flesh 100% of the time. Well, let me answer that question to remind you. The Bible teaches you were created to have fellowship with God. That's why you were created. Romans, I'm sorry, Revelations chapter 4, verse 11. Have you ever wondered in your heart what will fill that emptiness in you? Only God 
God created an empty place in your heart that only he can fill. When God fills it, you become fulfilled, satisfied, and life has a meaning. Let us stop there for one second. It is true for any Christian who is born again that their life is full and satisfied and fulfilled. And listen, if you walk in the Spirit. If you walk in the flesh, you are vulnerable to the emptiness, maybe not as deep, not as big as a non-believer. But if you walk in your flesh, you're just as susceptible in those thinkings and that emptiness as a non-Christian. When it talks about a life being fulfilled, it's talking about a life that is filled with God, filled with the Spirit of God. And God desires that for you. God wants you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But it's a choice of whether I'll walk in the Spirit of God, allowing the Spirit of God to control me. Maybe you have questions about what I'm to do with my life. If you yield to God, God will show you, without a doubt. God desires to shepherd you, but you must let him. When someone asks me a question, what do you think God wants me to do with this? And I get a lot of times these questions. I have people call me and, so what do you think? I said, it's not my, my, my decision to tell you what God wants you to do. If it's the scripture, I can tell you that. Should I marry an unbeliever? No, you should not. That's pretty simple, okay? Well, what about a decision about your own personal life? God makes a promise to you. Anyone who's willing to do my will, I am willing to show them my will. And the key is, okay, God, I will surrender my heart and surrender my life. Whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do. But keeping it there is another whole story. Because one moment you might be in the perfect place of saying that to God, and all of a sudden you might be pulled aside to something completely different than what God wants for your life. And I want to remind you of something. You are part of the body of Christ, and God has called you to be part and play a part, and that part is important. We saw that tonight when Dan wasn't here. And thank God for Helen. But my point is, you see what that, me, what that left it empty? I'm serious. If I would have been up here and doing the music, <laughs> you would have not been as happy as you are right now, I promise. So the Queen of Sheba came to Solomon to get hard answers. We can come to God, and God will give us hard answers, without a doubt. Not hard answers, heart answers. Now, he goes on, verse 2. So she came to Jerusalem with a great retinue, with camels that bore spices, very much gold, and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. It says here that she spoke to Solomon with all that was in her heart. In other words, she came and spent time with him and opened him herself open completely to Solomon. Now, we don't know how long Solomon knew her at this point. This is the first time he's ever met her. But we don't know if she spent time with him 15 minutes, three hours, a week, a month. We don't know how long she was there. But we do know one thing. She wanted the answer so much that she was willing to travel 1,500 miles also, and she was willing to totally open up. My point is, is this. Many times we want the answers from God, but we're not willing to spend that time with God and really open to God. Let me tell you my own thoughts concerning this and about my personal relationship with God. There are many times that I'm superficial with God. I pray a lot. I talk to God a lot. But there are times that God says to me, you're just hitting the surface, man. You're just scraping the top off. You, you, you got the skin. That's all you got. And many of us are like that. We only are surface with God. 
in order to really have that time with God and to hear God, we have to be completely honest with God. And I know we say this, well, God knows how I am. Yes, he does know how you are. But do you really know how you are? And are you really open to God? Well, I want God to know everything. He already does. You can't hide nothing from God. And by you just being superficial, you don't have that intimacy that God wants, and you don't have the answers that God wants to speak to you. Have you ever had somebody come up to you and say, hey, uh, I need to borrow a dollar. And really, uh, they don't need to borrow a dollar. They need to borrow a hundred dollars. You see, that's how we are with God sometimes. When we only go to superficial, God, I only need a buck. And God says, no, you don't. You're in trouble. You need a lot more than that. So she opens herself totally to this somewhat stranger. But in opening, she's going to get all the answers to her questions. Look at the next verse. So Solomon answers all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. So where is he getting this, all this counsel? How can a man who's totally a stranger, this woman come up to him and say, give all these questions, every single question that she had, and she's, you got to remember, you know how women are? They're wonderful. <laughs> but she's traveling for 1,500 miles. What do you think is going on in her mind on the camel? Oh, this stupid camel man, he's... he's <laughs> But I bet you she has a notepad and she's writing down questions as she's going. It took her months. And so she probably has a long list. But the scripture teaches literally that she was spoken. Every single question she had was answered. This is the wisdom of God coming out of Solomon. Every difficult, every concealed, the word means hidden. Every secret. He told her. Now, can God do something like that? Without a doubt, God wants to. Without a doubt. Verse 4, And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seeing of his servants, the service of his waiters and the apparel, his cupbearers and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no spirit in her left. In other words, it kind of just blew her away. Then she said to the king, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words until I came and I saw with my own eyes. And indeed, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceeds the fame of which I heard. Happy are your men and happy are your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who delights in setting you on the throne of Israel because the Lord has loved Israel forever. Therefore, he has made you king to do justice and to do righteousness. And no doubt, at this point of his life, Solomon was still walking with the Lord and honoring God. Because she saw what ascended into the place, or him ascended into a place of worship and praise of God. He was still right on, right where the place he needed to be with God. Jesus said this, Let your light so shine before men that when you see, they see your good works, they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. And evidently Solomon was doing this because as she sees this whole thing, she actually praises God. She doesn't know God. That's not what's happening. But she sees and the light that's coming through this man named Solomon. And everything's evident. Now, listen to this story. Being a light. A few years ago, a group of salesmen went to a regional sales convention in Chicago. They had assured their wives that they would be home in plenty of time for Friday night's dinner. In their rush, with tickets and briefcases, one of the salesmen inadvertently kicked over a table 
which held the display of apples. Apples flew everywhere. Without stopping or looking back, they all managed to reach the plane in time for the nearly missed boarding. All but one. He paused, took a deep breath, and got in touch with his feelings and experienced a twinge of compassion for the girl whose apple stand had been overturned. He took his buddies to go out, go on, told his buddies to go on without him, waved goodbye, told one of them to call his wife when he arrived at their home destination and explain he's taking a later flight. Then he returned to the terminal where his apples were all over the terminal floor. He was glad that he did. The 16-year-old girl was totally blind. She was softly crying, tears running down her cheeks in frustration, and all at the same time helplessly groping for her spilled produce as the crowd swirling about her. No one stopped and no one cared for her flight. The salesman knelt on the floor with her, gathered up the apples, put them back on the table, and helped organize her display. As he did this, he noticed that many of them had become battered and bruised. These he set aside in another basket. When he had finished, he pulled out his wallet and said to the girl, Hey, here, please, take this $40 for the damages we did. Are you okay? She nodded through her tears. He continued on with, I hope we didn't spoil your day too badly. As the salesman started to walk away, the bewildered blind girl called out to him, Mr. He paused and he turned to look back into those blind eyes. She continued, are you Jesus? He stopped in mid-stride and he wondered. He gently went back and he said, no, I am nothing like Jesus. He's good and kind and caring and loving and he would never have bumped into your display in the first place. The girl gently nodded. I only asked because I prayed for Jesus to help me gather the apples. He sent you to help me. So you are like him. Only he knows who will do his will. Thank you for hearing him and his call, mister. Then slowly he made his way to catch the later flight with the question burning and bouncing about in his soul. Are you Jesus? People hear the truth about Jesus, but they need to see it. They need to see it in our lives and out of our lives. We are his representatives. In this same part of the scripture, it says, happy are your men and happy are your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. It is a joyful thing for these men to serve a king like this who is wise. It is a joyful thing to serve God who is our king of kings who is wise. It says here, blessed be the Lord your God who delights in you. Now, in our natural man, in our nature, we have a problem many times because we know ourselves concerning God delighting in us. Now, God delights in Solomon here without a doubt because he's walking with him. Solomon is not a perfect man. In a little bit, you're going to see that Solomon makes some bad choices. He walks away from God. He does things against the scripture. But God still delights in him. The word literally means to be pleased with, to take pleasure in. You know, my grandchildren, my children can make mistakes. Little JJ the other day was, <laughs> he was doing some stuff and he, was, he wasn't being a bad boy in any way, but he was being, a, you know, just wanting candy. He loves suckers. And so uh, it didn't change my pleasure and my love for him in any way, what he was doing at all. And the same thing with you, it's no different. God never stops delighting and loving you. Does that mean he doesn't chase you? No, he does chase you because he loves you. And we need to realize that God is pleased with many times with us. Now, in these scriptures, we're going to see that God wants to bless his people constantly. 
And we see a fulfillment in the scriptures where God does bless his people. Amazingly. And it's true about you today that God wants your life to be blessed by him. If you see somebody else's life who's more blessed than you, there's a reason for it. It isn't because God has favorites. There are no favorites with God. There aren't. But if a person is more blessed than you, it's because they put themselves under the spout of God. In other words, they've yielded to God and obeyed God, even when they don't want to, even when it's hard, and the blessings of God has come upon their lives. That's how it works. Now, he goes on. Blessed be the Lord your God. In other words, he's saying, your God is blessed. It doesn't mean that he knows, she knows his, his God. It just says that your God is, is blessing. I've heard people say this. They're not Christians. God, your God has blessed you. Or your God has blessed that person, or blessed that person, or blessed that person. And they're really praising God, even though they don't know God. Listen to what it says in the, almost the last part of these verses. Because the Lord has loved Israel forever, therefore he has made you king. Why, does, why has God made Solomon king? Because God loves his people Israel. Love is a motivator. Now, I don't want to go too much on this, but I do want to mention this. The Bible speaks about the love of God and the importance of the love of God. And the importance of knowing how much God loves you personally. Let me ask you this question. I want you to think about it before we go on. How much do you believe that God loves you? And let me tell you what your thoughts may be. Well, I really believe that God loves me, but I did this. Or I'm not where I was three weeks ago. I'm not as close as God, and so God doesn't love me. That's not true. God's love never changes. Now, in the book of Jude, it says, keep yourself in the love of God. That doesn't mean that God doesn't love you or his, his, his love fluctuates. What it means is this. Keep yourself in a place where you can receive and experience that love, God, that love that God has for you. It's like walking out that door. You can go and walk right through that wall and try to do it. You're going to hurt yourself, of course. You're not going to make it because there's a lot of two-by-fours and steel there. But if that door is open, that's where you want to walk through, and that's where God wants you to be. And when you keep yourself in the love of God where God wants you to be, literally the blessings of God fall on your life, and the love of God comes forth. The Bible teaches that there's one thing that cancels out fear. You know what it is? Perfect love of God. You accepting God's love. You see, when you know that God loves you and you accept God's love, you're not afraid of whatever is going to happen in the future. This new disease, coronavirus, I'm not scared of that in any way. Well, you just say that, Pastor, because it's over in China. It's not close to you. Well, it is in California. That's true. There's a few cases. There's, I think, 12 cases. And, and it's, it's moving. My point is, you shouldn't be afraid of sudden, sudden disaster or sudden fear, the Bible teaches. And literally, it is the love of God that you need to understand and to accept and believe concerning God that will cancel out that fear. And there's been a, been a, has there ever been a time that we need to know that and live that? It's today. There is so much uncertainty out there, but not with God. There's 100% certainty with God. In the book of Matthew, let me give you a little bit about certainty of God. In the book of Matthew, it says in the last days, chapter 24, I believe it's verse 21, that God said there's going to be, in the last days, pestilence. And that's going to be really prevalent during the Great Tribulation. The church gets out of here before that. But my point is, God says that these things are going to happen. So I don't, have to, I don't have to be uncertain if I know the word of God. So my point is, we need to grow more in accepting the greatness of God's love for us. On his terms, not ours. 
Now, it says here that you were made king, talking to Solomon, to do justice and to do righteousness, to decide cases, to sentence, to make decisions, what was due and what's right. That's what the word justice means. And to do righteous, to do what's right before God. This is part of what Solomon was supposed to do. This is part of what you and I are supposed to do also. Now it goes on, verse 10. Then she gave the king 120 talents of gold, spices in great quantity, and precious stones. There never again came such abundance of spices as the queen of Sheba gave to Solomon. So let me tell you how many pounds a talent was. 164 and a half pounds was one talent. And she gave him 120, so it came to 39,480 pounds of gold. Now that may seem like a lot, and it is. But Solomon was going to send her away with more than what he gave her. What she gave him, I mean. I want you to notice she was willing to pay anything to get all her questions answered that were in her heart. Let me ask you the same question, or a question concerning that. Would you be willing to pay anything to get the answers that God would want you to receive that are in your heart? God is willing, and all he asks is you to spend time with him and in his word. And he'll give you the answers. Now, he goes on, verse 11. Also, the ships of Hiram, which brought gold from Ophir, brought great quantities of almug wood and precious stones from Ophir. And the king made steps of almug wood for the house of the Lord and for the king's house. Also, harps and stringed instruments for the singers. There never again came such almug wood, nor has there have been like seen to this day. So in other words, Israel's being totally blessed in every single way. They're becoming prosperous like never before, like no nation ever before. Now King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba all that she desired. When she asked besides what Solomon had given her according to the royal generosity, so she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. So, like I say, Solomon gave her more than she gave Solomon to take back with her. But let me share a, a tradition or story, possibly, that they believe happened. And they believe that she had a relationship with Solomon sexually. She had a child, took, took the child back, and he became, his name was Minlik, M-E-N-I-L-E-K, and he became a king, and many kings came from him. Matter of fact, the last king that came from his descendant, they say, was in 1974, where he lost his kingdom, and they uh, did a uh, rebellion against him. That's just a thought, so just to kind of think about that if you want to. Now, verse 14, the way of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold, besides that from the traveling merchants, from the income of traders, from all the kings of Arabia, and from the governors of their country. So, all these things that we see, God made a promise a long time ago that he wanted to bless his people, give them this land, and he's going to bless these people this time. And I want you to understand that God made these promises a long time ago to God's people, and he's fulfilling them. I want to read to you in Deuteronomy the same thought, these promises. It says this, chapter 17, when you come to the land which the Lord your God has given you and possess it and you dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, and you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from whom among your brethren you shall set a king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother, but he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses for the God, for the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall ye multiply wives for himself, lest he his heart turn away. Nor shall he 
greatly multiply silver, gold for himself, and it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of the law in a book for the one before the priests and the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of the law and these statutes, and that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandments of the right hand or the left, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and the children in the midst of Israel. Now, why did I read that to you? Let me tell you why. God is blessing them, and God is prospering them, but they are going beyond that even. And they're multiplying and going, really, here's where Solomon begins to go against the things of the word of God. And we're going to see this progression so why does God tell them not to do this? The reason is that their hearts would turn away from the Lord. Look at me. Let me ask you this question. How many of you ever thought, if God would give me this, I know I would be okay. And then God doesn't do it. Let me tell you why God doesn't do it. Because he knows that you won't be okay. If God was to say to you, you know what, I'm going to let you win the lottery. Oh, I'll handle it right, God. I know that. I'll be so good about it, Lord. 10% for the church, right away, right off the top. Is that before taxes or after taxes? That's what your mind begins to think. And before you know it, all I'm saying is, there are certain things we can't handle. And God doesn't want to multiply on, not this Sunday, but next Sunday, we're going to be talking about the stewardship of God. And God gives us examples of how we're supposed to be stewards. And everything that God gives us, we're going to give an account to God as a steward. Now, a steward, remember, stuff does not belong to the steward. It belongs to the master. And in the instance of the story of the stewards, it literally says that God is the master and he owns everything and he gives us those things to take care of him and use them for his kingdom and for his glory. We see Solomon doing what he's supposed to do in many ways. He's following the Lord, but he's deviating and he's starting to get sidetracked. And because he's not doing this, his heart is going to be turned away from God, not for riches so much, but for other gods, for other gods. Now he goes on. Verse 17, Then King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 600 shields of gold went into each shield. He made 300 shields of hammered gold. Three miners of gold went to each shield. The king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. So each shield was worth $120,000. The smaller shields were worth 30,000. So 300 and I'm sorry, 33 million were invested in gold ceremonial shields. Now, these shields were of no value. You can't carry gold like that. And not only that, it's soft. It was a waste. Now, usually we expect just stupid people to do stupid things. Under the category, too stupid, here's a true story out of San Francisco. Ah, I can see why it's out of San Francisco. It seems a man wanting to rob a downtown Bank of America walked into the branch and he wrote, this is I-Z, a stick-up, S-T-I-K-K-U-P. Pull all your money, M-U-N-Y, in this bag. While standing in line waiting to give his note to the teller, he began to worry that someone had seen him write the note and he might call the police before he reached the teller's window. So he left the Bank of America and crossed the street to Wells Fargo. After waiting a few minutes in line, he handed his note to the Wells Fargo teller. She read it 
and surmising from his spelling errors that he was not the brightest light in the harbor, took him, told him she could not accept his stick-up note because it was written on a Bank of America deposit slip. <laughs> and that he would either have to fill out a Wells Fargo deposit slip or go back to the Bank of America. Can you believe that? This is a real story. Looking somewhat defeated, the man said, okay, and left the Wells Fargo. The Wells Fargo teller then called the police who arrested the man in a few minutes later as he was waiting in line back at the Bank of America. Here's the wisest man on earth doing one of the stupidest things on earth. You don't have to be stupid to do stupid things. Moreover, verse 18, moreover the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with pure gold. The throne had six steps and the top of the throne was round at the, at the back. There were armrests on each side of the place of the seat and two lions stood beside their armrests. Twelve lions stood there, one on each side of the six steps. Nothing like this has ever been made for any other king. All King Solomon's drinking vessels were gold, and the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. No one was silver, none were silver, for this was accounted as nothing in the days of Solomon. For the king had merchant ships at the sea, the fleet of Haram, once every three years. The merchant ships came bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, monkeys. So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. So everything that seems that Solomon touches right now turns to gold. Now all the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. Each man brought his present, articles of silver and gold, garments, armor, spices, horses and mules at a set rate year by year. So in other words, they had, he had tribute. And Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horsemen, whom he stationed in chariot cities and with, the king, and with the king in Jerusalem. And the king made silver and common in Jerusalem as stones. And he made cedar trees as abundant as the sycamore, which are in the lowlands. Now I want to say this before we go on, and we're almost done. When we get to a little further in this book of Kings, we're going to see his son named Rehoboam. And the, the leaders and a lot of the people are going to come and they're going to ask him, hey, are you going to tax us like your dad? And we'll see that story when we go down. But my point is, is this. All this money is coming in, all this gold is coming in, all this tribute is coming in, and he's still taxing these people to death. And because of it, his son will lose the kingdom or lose 10 of the tribes of the kingdom. I'm amazed that all this coming in and he's killing the people in taxes. I think he was a California governor. <laughs> <laughs> and Solomon had horses imported from Egypt and Kaveh. The king's merchants bought them in Kaveh at the current price. Now, a chariot was an importer from Egypt, cost 600 shekels of silver, and a horse 150, and thus, through their agents, they exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Assyria. So we see Solomon building his empire, but we see him doing wonderful things at the beginning, and he's walking with the Lord, but then he drifts. And he begins to do things against the word of God. I have found it true in my own personal life, in every other Christian's life, this is true. That when somebody goes against the word of God, you can't win. I don't care what it is. You can't win. You automatically lose. And we will see Solomon does lose. 
You and I in our personal lives, if you know the scripture, if there's something that God's telling you and you go against it deliberately, you can't win. You're going to lose in that area. That's how it works. But let me reverse that. If you know the word of God and you apply that to your life, whatever it may be, you can't but win. That's how it works. And that includes anything our children do. If they go against the word of God, they can't win. They can't win. So we'll stop there tonight. Any questions on our study tonight? Okay, we have the blessings of doing the Lord's Supper. Will our worship team come up, please? <laughs>